about the color of language and its impact on gender stereotypes. My name is Danielle Cohen, and I hope you all enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think of the phrase Nana, what comes to mind? Well, generally speaking, and branching off some biases here, I can tell you that most of you in this room, uh, who, most of the males in this room, who then grew up to be fathers, have used this phrase at least once in your lifetime. Essentially, essentially this phrase man up has caused many stereotypes within America today. And what we see is that what does the phrase man up really mean? What does it mean to be masculine? Masculine, as a result of these boys growing up to be fathers, who then teach their sons the same thing, has become essentially a learned trait passed on from generation to generation, yet also a result of societal pressures. So what does it mean to be a boy? What does it mean to be masculine? Eva Ensler, an internationally acclaimed author, actress, and feminist, global, uh, fem uh, feminist, after feminist, has explained that this type of mentality has essentially taught the world not to be a girl. That would be, that would be emotion, vulnerability, openness, compassion. She argues that it is this type of mentality that we've instilled within both women and children today, along with the males who are perpetuating it, are the problems that are faced in America. However, I believe the effects of such subtle ideology that began once as a catchy motivator have grown to permeate society in a way that has long, long-standing negative impacts on both men and women alike. And to introduce this to you, I'd like to show you a quick movie. I don't think it's going to play. where Michelle Bachman and many other political uh, leaders in the world today, battle women, have just been called to act like a lady. They've been told to act like a lady, to be more of women-like. And that was just the kind of idea that I was trying to get at. But I'd like to introduce you to Tony Porter, who is now a feminist activist, but uh, originally was a 12-year-old boy once, black African-American, living in the Bronx. He tells his story as this 12-year-old boy, growing up with his neighborhood friends, where he had this cousin, Johnny. He was 16 years old, and on an occasion when they were lucky, these 12-year-old boys would get to play with Johnny, a 16-year-old who was cool. Basically what happened one day is that when Tony was out playing with his friends, Johnny called out to him to come play with them. And when Johnny calls, he went, because Johnny was the cool older boy. So Tony goes up to Johnny, he asks what's up, and the first thing he saw was through a cracked door where Johnny was standing, Sheila, a neighborhood girl, also 16, standing nude in the room. Johnny, the 16-year-old pool boy, asks Tony, do you want some? In this case, do you want some? I've always either meant sex or drugs. So, obviously, Tony must do what it meant this time, and Tony, as a 12-year-old boy, had never had sex, never done drugs, but, you know, at that age, you just assume everyone's done it because that's how the neighborhood works that time. So, during this obvious uh, situation of confusion, Tony, not risking his reputation in front of the older pool boys for the future, simply said yes and went into the room. As Tony went into the room, he stood there with Sheila petrified, stood against the wall, the, stood against the wall, knowing he wasn't going to have sex with this girl, but obviously not knowing what to do about his situation. So, in his 12 years of wisdom, he zipped down his pants, allowed enough time for something to have actually happened to happen, and he walked right back out of the door. There he sees Johnny and his other friends standing, looking at him, waiting for a reply, and they ask how it was. Tony, a 12-year-old boy who obviously had no idea what to do with this type of situation, looked at them, said it was good, and proceeded to go on with his life. Well, he said he felt a great deal of remorse for completely being enveloped in his man box, and he obviously wasn't thinking about Sheila and her and victimizing her as a result of this. He was also excited to not have been called a girl, to be able to walk out of that room in full confidence knowing that he did nothing wrong, but he also committed one of the worst crimes he could commit. Ladies and gentlemen, with this type of mentality that has been instilled with our boys, which is obviously an extreme case, but is also one of the biggest problems we face today. And I believe this can be summed up with one sentence later published by Tony himself that says, if it would destroy a 12-year-old boy, if it would destroy a 12-year-old boy to be called a girl, then what are we teaching him about girls today? And I think that is definitely a, a key topic which I want you to keep in mind as I proceed with today's uh, presentation. 
So, uh, moving, uh, moving on away from this kind of study story, I'd like to turn you to the mass media and its effect that it's had on the sexualization of gentrification uh, of women today. As we see, modern pop music, Disney, and even the difference between uh, pink and blue have had the effects on children in the form, have had such stringent effects on children in the formative years. We see that with rap music today, I don't know if you can read the lyrics of that, but there's simply something that is not going to be taught to our 10 year old uh, children. It's such my little brother, you can figure out that you should not be listening to something like that. But further moving on, we see that in Disney today, this is all the princesses who become those damsels in distress have to be saved by a, fee, uh, a male figure, someone who can save them from whatever distress they put in or become more pretty to be saved by them. But this is even farther, uh, farther connected to the roots of what we see as children today as the difference between pink and, pink and blue is so, certainly something that needs to be focused on. As girls, when they grow up, have no problem uh, looking at pink and blue, playing with pink and blue, anything to have to do with that since, you know, they grow up in the crib. But boys, for the most part, they refuse to play with pink because it's far too girly. So, moving on from now, we see that the roots of such a subtle ideology, growing up with colors, growing up with the princesses, growing up with rap music as little kids today, we now look to what, how they grow up, what's going on when they grow up, and that's simply looked at in the workforce. As we see today, on surface level, the workforce and the women in the workforce have been deprived of their, have been deprived, have been deprived of the workforce. Um, for the past decade, as 52 percent of populations in college are now made up of women, and the growing middle class is predominantly being made up by women today. However, once we look past the surface level, the reality is less than 60 percent of Fortune 500 officers are women, and less than 2 percent of Fortune 500 and 1,000 officers are women. On average, a woman's wages are only 81 percent of men's, and this is done uh, based on a figure of both the same job, the same responsibilities, and exactly the same procedures that have to be uh, that have to be completed. So, obviously, you can assume that these top executive positions have barely seen any movement since 2002, and are simply going in the wrong direction. Now, I bring you to an issue of current events today. A recent uh, large pharmaceutical company, one of the largest in the world, actually, just settled a $250 monetary settlement as a result of sexual harassment. The situation in 2012 today was that these sales executives were requiring their female sales representatives to sit on their laps in order to get the sales leads that they needed for the commission. I don't know about you, but I'm liking some of the uh, facial expressions I see from the women up there. But this is simply unacceptable, especially in 2012 in a world where, especially in a country, America, where we see women and women in the workforce and gender equality being so prominent, something like this simply should not be happening. But moving on, while the private sector simply is going to be a large factor in uh, redefining gender equality, we see that the government and politics is certainly going to be a people path. That is, most of you already know that out of the 44 presidents we've had, um, obviously we know that none of them have been women. Yet, out of the 190 heads of state, nine have been women. So, to give you kind of an idea, I turn you to three prominent females in, the, in politics today. Despite your political ideology, I'm going to talk about them hopefully on the most objective basis I can. We look towards Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, and Hillary Clinton. So usually most will uh, categorize Sarah Palin and uh, Michelle Bachman uh, because they're Republican and with Hillary Clinton on the other side. The general criticism that these two have gotten that being Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman is that they only reached to the level they did was because they were attractive or they were hot. They received criticism alongside that as being too emotional, too girly. They cried. They have feelings. They express their opinions on a subjective basis as opposed to ob uh, objective as all men do. But on the opposite side, we see Hillary Clinton, who, again, despite political ideology, has criticism saying that she's far too stern. She's not sincere enough. She's unattractive. Ladies and gentlemen, as opposed to males today, we see that females get these criticisms that then define their whole political lifestyle. As soon as they enter the arena, that definition, that whatever criticism it may be, sticks with them for the rest of politics. It sticks with them in voting turnout, and it sticks with them for whatever they decide to do in the, in the long run. Hillary Clinton is now defined by the Bill, uh, Bill Clinton sex scandal far more so than Bill Clinton simply because she didn't make Bill. These are the kind of, this is the kind of ideology that is so pressed upon women to be able to survive in a world like this where males are seen as the dominant figure. But comparatively, 
as I am looking at the glass half empty, we do have a faith. We live in a world where many of us uh, growing up did have basic civil rights, and amazingly, many do not. For most of the girls in here today, we don't live in a world where our mothers lived in, our grandmothers lived in, and so on, where career choices for women were so limited. We are very lucky. However, across borders, we see that in Middle Eastern nations, that women being raped, they're the ones jailed. They're the ones put into, uh, put, into, uh, to, put into jail as a result of being raped because they were the ones who dishonored their husbands, even though it was completely against their own consent. Ladies and gentlemen, being a woman, having talked to a woman, or having talked to a woman in these countries, talking to a male, getting education, simply going to college is all of the male's consent. And this is certainly a problem that we see, specifically in the Democratic Republic of Congo. A 12-year war has been waged, where women are militarily assaulted, raped, murdered, all of their own, all of the military's will. So what we see is that these little boys, no more than 15, 16, 17 years old, you in this room, are killing, doing, making these assaults, all because they don't really know where they're going to get their next meal, where they're going to spend the night the next day. Their emotions are essentially turned into bullets as we see their tears become hardened. These types of situations, whether it be in America or abroad, have got to be recognized, not only by women, not only by feminist activists, but by males and women alike to work together, which is why Tony is such a great example as a male working on an initiative today. So, the solution is awareness, like I said. We need to recognize that rap music's never going to stop, the Disney princesses aren't going to disappear, but we have to recognize that when these males and females work together and understand the consequences of their actions, which usually are a result of such subtle and thoughtless ideology, really do make a difference in the long run. So, as soon as we can recognize this together, the world and gender equality will begin to be redefined. So, when you look back at what I was saying in my intro, like, uh, what does it mean to be a boy? It means not to be a girl. What does it mean to be a man? It means not to be a girl. What does it mean to be strong? It means not to be a girl. Well, I believe that so many people have been so scared of the results of, of a girl-dominated society that we've had to train everyone else. 